So this evening we are going to be looking at um, from the Cutty's Arc to now. So how can the resurgence of the use of wind power support a greener shipping industry? Um, so to start with, as many of you will know, Lloyd's was founded in 76, 1760. And like lots of good ideas, it was all started over a cup of coffee. So the original idea behind Lloyd's was to make sure that ship owners and sailors had all the necessary information that they needed. And Lloyd's was founded right in the middle of what is often referred to as the golden age of sail. And this is often quoted as being from between 1571 to 1862. And this is a period, a period when there's a huge amount of technological advances in sail ships. And this is all driven by the need for um, exploitation and exploration of natural resources across the world. Um, be this through trade, through fishing um, and whaling. So when Lloyd's was set up, this all would have been very much um, in sale. However, although uh, we often look at the golden age of sail, and it's sometimes referred to as the western age of sail, sail is obviously a much, much older technology. Um, one of the museum's oldest collection pieces um, <coughs> is the sacred boat of Osiris. Um, so Osiris is the god um, of the dead um, in Egypt, and this is actually a funeral barge. Now, for the observant amongst you, you'll notice that it doesn't have sail. Um, and we think that this model is from around 1820 BC. So it's one of the oldest items in the museum's collection. It's very rare for a model to survive this long. Um, however, we know that around the same period, you were finding sail ships um, in Egypt. Towards the other end of the Age of Seal, Sail, another model in the museum's collection is HMS Devastation. Now, this was launched by the Royal Navy in 1871, and this really marks a departure and move away from sail. This was the first of the Royal Navy um, ships that wasn't a hybrid. So although the Royal Navy had been using engine-driven ships, steamships and paddle ships for, for quite some time by this point, this was the first one that they launched with no sails at all. Um, this gives quite a big advantage as it means that suddenly your arm armaments can um, be on top of the hull rather than underneath it. So this suddenly gives you a 280 degree angle um, of fire. And the reason that this is suddenly possible is you no longer need to worry about accidentally damaging your own sails um, while in battle. So as I said tonight, uh, to, as I've already said, tonight we're going to be focusing on the period from the Cutty's Ark onwards. Um, but why is this? So the Cutty's Ark was launched seven years after the end of the Golden Age of Sail. You could argue that Sail has already peaked. It's a little bit of an oddity that she was built at all. Um, and this is partly um, due to this year marking the 150th anniversary of the launch of the Cutty's Ark. So she is the birthday girl this year, so she does deserve a little bit of our attention. Um, and being a little bit self-indulgent at the National Maritime Museum, we're very fond of her, as she is the largest object in our collection. However, she has increasing importance as she marks a real turning point um, in the story of sailing and of shipping. So we often think of the Cutty's Ark as being this record-breaking tea clipper. She's often described as one of the last great tea clippers, but actually her record-breaking happens later in her life and to do with the wool trade. As the Cutty's Ark was launched, the shipping industry was facing this huge turning point. So um, with the Cutty's Ark, you could argue that she was commissioned by quite a conservative owner. They themselves had gained their experience from being at sea themselves. They're very comfortable with sail. This is a technology that they know very well. They understand the economics of it. They understand the crew needs of it and the training needs. Whereas the incoming steamships would be this kind of foreign technology to them. 
However, on the reverse of the same period, you've got more commercial driven shipping owners. They're seeing the opportunities that this new technology can give them. Suddenly, you can move much quicker. Um, and this brings with it a lot of commercial advantages. Within a few days of the Cutty's Ark being launched in 1869, we have a huge turning point in that the Suez Canal opens, um, which obviously changes um, the, the game a little bit. Now, to go back a little bit, pre 50 years before the Cutty's Ark, so in a time we're still considering the golden age of sail, we're beginning to see huge techno technological advances with steamships. So in 1899, so 50 years before the Cutty's Ark, so 1819, sorry, the SS Savannah um, was the first steamship to cross the Atlantic. Now, for the observant among us, we might think, well, actually, that's quite clearly a sail ship. <laughs> to say that this marks the beginning of the end of sail seems a little bit strange. But in the picture, we can also notice that she's got the, the paddle steamers on her. Um, and for, the, for America, this marked quite a patriotic moment. It's a young country showing that they are technology advanced, they're moving forward. And at the time in the press, um, there was a lot of kind of uh, positive responses to this. However, at the same time, the owners were having to put out adverts asking for passengers to come on board. They were really struggling to find anyone willing to take a chance on this transatlantic journey. Um, one of the reasons sometimes given for them uh, failing to, to find any passengers in order to make this economically viable as a journey um, was the death of one of the crew members. So unfortunately, uh, two days before they were due to travel, one of the crew members returned to the ship slightly drunk um, and fell overboard and unfortunately was drowned. So this is sometimes given as a reason why people might be slightly suspicious of the ship. They might see it as having had bad luck. It's a bad omen. Um, however, I would argue that two days before a voyage, you should have your passengers in place. There's obviously other reasons why people really weren't seeing this as a ship that they would want to go on. So we can see that people can often be slightly wary of new technologies. However, despite this slightly inauspicious start, not able to get any passengers, and she's a converted packet ship. So as a sail ship, she would have been taking mail, which isn't that lucrative a business. This is why they tried to convert her to a passenger ship. By taking passengers, you'd make enough money to pay for all of the fuel that you would need for the engine. <coughs> but it wasn't to be. So off she sat off, um, and it must, be quite, it must have been quite a sight. So from this picture, it looks quite majestic. But from reports, there's quite a few ships seeing her out at sea, and they thought she was on fire because they were seeing all of this smoke bellowing. And there's reports of several ships trying to catch up with her because they thought that this was a ship in distress. There was all the, the um, smoke bellowing behind her. Um, and one of the, the ships following her that she'd overtaken, the Kite, um, they actually shot some warning shots into the air to tell her to stop because they were really worried, quite worried about this ship. Um, the SS Savannah stopped, and the crew from the kite went on board. And in their reports, they waxed lyrical about how amazing and a marvel and kind of a triumph for the United States of America this ship was. <laughs> Whereas just previously, they'd been pretty worried she was on fire. Um, and at times, the SS Savannah was, was moving very, very quickly. However, although she managed to get all the way to Cork, at this point, she'd run out of fuel. So her destination was to, to port in Liverpool, but she was completely out of coal. <laughs> so they had to wait two days to get um, kind of the right wind conditions in order to make it to Liverpool. However, still this arrival was celebrated. Um, and she's entered the record books as the first ship um, steamship to cross the Atlantic. However, if we look into the logbooks, we'll see it's not quite as good as a record as it might at first seem. So the voyage had lasted 29 days and 11 hours. 
However, during this time, the ship was only using its engine for about 80 of those hours. Um, so about 11% of the time. <laughs> so you could argue that she really wouldn't have been able to do it. She definitely wouldn't have had enough coal to do this without the sails. So hybrids are very, very important. But as success stories go, um, this was quite a mixed success story. Um, and the owners were unable to make the economics work. They had some other misfortunes happen, um, but they did actually eventually end up turning her back into a packet ship and uh, using her just with sails. They took the engines out, engines are very heavy, um, and just using her as a sail ship. And no um, American-owned uh, steamship would try and repeat this voyage for around another 30 years. <clears throat> so what changed? So as I said, um, the Katizark's year of birth marks a, a turning point um, for the shipping industry. And this is in part uh, due to the Suez Canal. So on the screen now, we have some uh, coins, some medals um, that were minted to, to celebrate the opening of the Suez Canal. Um, and we have the representation of Neptune. It's a celebration of the sea, but also kind of man's triumph over it. Um, and why the Suez Canal suddenly leads to this decline in, in sail ships being profitable is because it, it provides a pretty nifty shortcut for steamships. So suddenly, steamships were given a 4,000-mile shortcut on the very lucrative China to London route. So this was the route that they were bringing things like tea back on, which is where um, traders were able to make their, the main profit. Sail ships aren't able to use this. So although the steamships themselves haven't improved significantly, suddenly if you're, you're able to travel 4,000 miles less than your competitive sail ship. That's a pretty winning... Um, advantage. The other thing that's happening around the same time is um, a new and more efficient engine. So on the screen here we have a, a drawing um, of the triple expansion engine. So the advantage of this is that it allows steam to be used three times um, before being turned back by the condenser into fresh water for the boilers. Um, and the boilers themselves were improved and designed to allow higher steam pressure. So it means that we're moving away from the really inefficient engines of ships like the SS Savan that are using up huge amounts of water and coal that are unsustainable. Um, HMS Devastation, the ship that we looked at at the very beginning, she was actually converted to one of these um, triple expansion engines by the Royal Navy. That's how much they saw the advantage of this new technology. So <clears throat> as with any early um, adoption of new fuel types, this always comes with the limitation that there's the lack of the infrastructure to support it. So this was the challenge that the early steamships found. So even after they had the huge advantage of the opening of the Suez Canal, they had this struggle of finding enough coal and enough clean water. Often we think of, of coal, it's quite obvious, if you've got an engine, you need coal. But another struggle is fresh water um, in order to, to supply them. And um, so this means that you get a continuation of the hybrid ships that are still using um, the, the sails for far after what we consider the golden age of sail to have ended. However, as coal becomes much cheaper, and the infrastructure is built up by specialist companies, um, you, still, you see a decline um, in these, these hybrids being used as it's no longer commercially viable. However, surprisingly, <clears throat> despite the end of what we call the so-called golden age of sail, we're still seeing innovation happening in sail. And this is generally due to the lack of the ability to carry enough coal for the type of engines that were available. For innovation to happen with um, fuel-based technologies, you still needed the supporting kind of free energy, if you will, of sail power. So a good example of this is the uh, Dunedin ship. 
Um, <clears throat> and this is sometimes referred to as a ship that really revolutionized um, the world. And this is because she was the first refrigerator ship that was able to successfully bring frozen food from um, New Zealand to the UK. Now, depending on um, sometimes the nationality of the historian, <laughs> it can be presented in two different ways. So you can either say that this was an amazing feat for uh, uh, New Zealand. It had a founding economy, it had a lot of land, but actually quite a small population. So although they were able to raise a lot of sheep and produce a lot of meat, there wasn't the kind of demand in their own country to actually sell it. At the same time, um, in England in the 1880s, we had an increasing population. There was an increasing demand within that population for fresh meat. Generally, people weren't happy with kind of salted meat. So there was this, and this was leading to an increase in the price of meat. And as soon as food prices start to increase, you're obviously starting to get social instability. So from both countries, there was this drive for the need to get um, a better supply of fresh meat. The problem was getting it to the UK. <laughs> so obviously you can freeze the lamb in New Zealand. The challenge is how do you get it all the way here? So steam powered refrigerators had been invented at this point, but they're very, very coal intensive. So the Dunedin, which had previously been a ship used for immigration, um, was retrofitted in order to carry these coal powered um, refrigeration units. However, it wouldn't have been possible to a ship to also have been able to carry enough coal at this point to, to power the ship itself, which is why we end up with the slightly odd combination of a sail ship that's using a lot of coal, coal but not for its engines, um, for refrigeration. Um, <clears throat> so the, the owners of the Dunedin were able to um, freeze 10,000 carcasses of lamb. Um, and they actually had a little bit of an aborted first mission. Um, unfortunately, there were some engineering problems with the ship, and they had to sell on the cargo back to a butcher in New Zealand. So there was lots of jokes about th at the time about this being a very profitable mission, but actually for the butchers of New Zealand, not for the shipping owners. They did, however, successfully set off um, on the 15th of February with 5,000 carcasses of sheep on board. Once again, they had advertised for passengers. They had the facilities to carry passengers, but perhaps partly because of the failed first voyage, they'd had to give refunds for these original tickets and they could find no passengers again. People weren't willing to take a chance on this slightly odd hybrid ship. Um, and along the way, they did have a few mishaps as they were sailing to England. Um, during the voyage, um, they discovered that the refrigeration units had stopped working. And there's these heroic tales of the captain himself being lowered down into the refrigeration unit um, and having to kind of fix it to get it working again, to remove the blockage and almost freezing to death and being hauled out. How accurate this is as a story, um, I think we should take with a little bit of pinch of salt. But we do know that it did have some few engineering problems around, along the way. At the same time, in England, there was some scepticism about how good quality this lamb would be. It had been frozen in New Zealand, it had been put on a ship, and it had come. And actually, at the time, butchers in Smithfield Market, not that far away from where we are today, took out adverts in the papers saying that they would never stock this meat. Um, they would never take something so inferior. They would never take something as low quality. Um, but the ship proved them wrong. Um, of the 5,000 sheep that um, arrived in the UK, only one had spoiled and had to be disposed of. And actually, in time, many of the butchers um, decided that this was very, very high quality meat, um, and they were very, very willing to stock it. Um, and the Dunedin was able to um, have nine more successful voyages bringing lamb to the UK and really paved the way. Um, and her journey is followed by the, the Lloyd Register Foundation's archive. Um, and you can see that she had a few kind of mechanical issues, but generally very successful voyages. Unfortunately, the last time um, that she pops up in the records here um, 
is the last place that you want to find a ship, um, and that's in the REC reports. Um, and you can just spot, it's a little bit small, um, oh, the second one down on the list. You can see that the Dunedin um, <coughs> was last recorded um, and sighted in 1819. And that's all that we know about her. No one's quite sure what happened. She was last sighted by her sister ship. They saw her go along her journey, and then they're not sure what, what happened next. Um, rather poignantly, um, she did have one passenger with her on that journey, um, and that was Captain Robert's daughter. That was the only passenger, and it's assumed that she was lost um, with the ship and the entire crew. So the, the archives here also follow the Cutty's Ark. Um, so the first document we have is from the Cutty's Ark's launch, her first being registered um, and classed. Um, and then the, the second document is a lot, lot later at the end of her life. Um, and this is referring to her being delivered to dry docks in 1950 to Greenwich. So it really follows the whole arc of her life, being launched as a, a tea clipper and then being dry docked in Greenwich. <coughs> um, and during her operation, the Cutty's Ark saw a huge amount of change. She was um, designed to be a really, really fast ship. So when we look at her design, she's got these beautiful, smooth um, hull, and it's all about being as fast as possible. She was built to last 30 years. Um, like many ships now, they're generally designed for 20 to 25 to 30 years. Um, but she served as a working ship for 52 years, <laughs> um, and then a training ship after that for 22 years. And she's now been a visitor attraction for 60 years. So she's done very well to have lasted all of that time. She's often described as being a tea clipper, which is correct. But actually, her record-breaking voyages were in the wool trade. Um, during this time, she did see um, changes to her usage, but also her sail shape. So she, we know that she had at least two different um, times of, of change. One um, for her record-breaking voyage, um, they cut down the sails. And we suspect now that she perhaps was actually over-designed. So when they first created her, she perhaps actually had too many sails. And it got to the point where they were producing more drag, more weight. There was no advantage. So surprisingly, her record-breaking um, were with less sails. Um, and then when she moved into Portuguese ownership at the end of her operational life as the Fiera, um, the sails were cut down and changed again, and she was completely re-rigged. And this was in order to, to kind of balance out the profit margins um, and kind of lead to having less crew. Um, and this is quite common with, with ships at this time. There's always this balance between your costs. So you're wanting to make sure that you can carry as much cargo as possible, um, but you want to be as fast as possible and also have the least amount of crew as possible. <laughs> so for any, which sounds like an impossible ship. So it's balancing kind of the, the needs of that. And we see that in modern shipping today. Nothing has changed. So um, in the corner there, we, we can see the hull of the Cutty's Ark from, from the underneath. Um, she's very unusual in the sail ship in that she's now suspended in the air. Um, but it does mean that it gives us the advantage of being able to to really look at how kind of smooth the whole shape is. And this is to maximize her speed through the water. Often kind of wind power is described as being this kind of limitless supply. It's free, it's available, but actually this isn't true. It's a very limited resource for when you've got the correct amount of wind and speed of wind. So when you're relying only on wind power, you need to make sure that you're using that force that you're getting for the wind as much as possible. With the Cutty's Ark, because she was taking part in these tea races and you're getting a premium for the cargo, it was this balancing act between her being as streamlined as possible but also being able to carry as much cargo as possible. Whereas what we see with our modern cargo ships, so our container ships, is a move away from this. Shipping fuel is, is relatively cheap, um, and therefore you end up with these kind of 
suboptimal designs. For the owners and operators of this ship, they're happy to have more drag through the water with these very box-like shapes um, because the, the shipping oil is so cheap, the fuel, that you can kind of counteract that cost by being able to carry more cargo. Um, and you kind of see this, this over time. So containerization, which obviously comes in, in much later, um, is where we see a huge shift in shipping, in that we've suddenly gone to this uniform cargo. Um, and you want to make sure that your um, container ship is able to carry the maximum amount of cargo possible. So whereas the Katizak and sailing ships were this kind of equation between the time you would take to travel, you want to travel as quickly as possible, your crew costs against the amount of cargo you can carry, with fossil fuel ships, we still have significant crew costs. However, we've got the added um, equation in there of how much it costs you for, for fuel. So often to counteract how much fuel you're using, you're trying to carry more and more cargo. <clears throat> now, on what is, I assume, going to be a record-breakingly hot day, it seems a little bit ironic to be talking about climate change and the environmental impact of shipping. Um, but shipping is an industry that now relies solely on fossil fuels. Um, and looking back into the history books, um, we begin to see that this isn't a new concern. Um, last year, there was reports where someone had found some old papers where Brunel, Brunel himself, who we think of kind of this father of industry, was talking about pollution and his concern about shipping and other industries. And reading them, I think his concern is mainly about it making things look a bit dirty <laughs> rather than, than emissions. Um, but it isn't something that we can ignore. Um, today um, is, is part of that trend, but we can see that over time we're having an increase in average temperature. Obviously, one very hot day <laughs> isn't proof of climate change. However, we know that there's an increase in the likelihood of these kind of extreme weather conditions, and in general, linked to an increase in greenhouse gases, we are having an increase in global temperatures. For shipping in sp specific, we also need to look at emissions. So a study by the scientific journal Nature last year um, looked at what is the effect of all of the emissions that are coming out of shipping. Um, and they calculated that there's approximately 400,000 premature deaths worldwide per year just from the emissions of shipping. Um, and there's an additional 14 million childhood cases of asthma per year. Um, it's a little bit hard to spot, but um, from this, this map here, you can see, as you'd expect, that this is really concentrated along um, the busiest shipping lanes. Um, <clears throat> the, the second graph shows the potential improvement that we could have if we decrease these emissions. Um, and there are global measures coming in to try and address this. So in January um, of 2020, so the clock is ticking down for this, we have what's coming in called the, the sulfur cap of 2020. And this will reduce the amount of sulfur that ships can emit. So it will decrease down from the current rate of 3.5% to 0.5%. Um, but this really has to be seen as an interim measure. Um, if we were to look at um, shipping as a country, it would be emitting about 3% of all of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, it would be the sixth most polluting country in the world. <laughs> Um, so it has a really significant impact um, on the world around us. 
There are measures being taken, such as the IMO sulfur cap, but these are very much interim measures, and new technologies are needed in order to address this. Um, one of these measures is once again looking back to um, things like wind power and saying, well, actually, are there ways that we can move away from fossil fuels? When we had the end of the um, age of sail and we started to move away from the use of wind, this was all based on economics. Um, there was no kind of account taken for the impact that it was having on the, the environment. However, now we, we know better and we, we can't ignore this. <clears throat> so there's been <clears throat> plenty of headlines um, around this and looking at what new technologies there could be in sailing. Um, and one of my favourite headlines is, um, <clears throat> are we entering a new age of sail? And sometimes they'll pop a little picture of the Cutty's Ark up. Um, <laughs> and my answer is, maybe, but it's going to look very, very different from the Cutty's Ark. Um, now, up um, the picture here um, is of a 1920s Thames barge um, called the Raybell. Um, she has just been successful in securing a heritage lottery grant to be restored, um, and she is part of the global cargo network. So this is a network of people who are actually going back and either building new ships or restoring old sail ships in order to use them to transport cargo across the world, which is a really, really interesting idea. Um, and one of their aims is actually just to get people to stop and think and say, actually, does shipping have to look like these giant container shipping ships that we've all got used to? However, I think they would be the first to admit that this isn't the way forward. <laughs> We're not going to be able to build thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of replica Cutty's arcs in order to supply global trade. For example, in the UK, about 80 to 85% of everything that we're using is being brought in by ships. Most of the food that we'll eat today, most of the clothes that we're wearing, is all coming in by shipping. And it's really important to remember that although shipping is this incredibly polluting industry, it's actually currently the best option. By weight, if we were to put the same goods onto an aeroplane or a train or a lorry, the emissions would actually be higher. So the solution isn't to say we should avoid shipping, it's say how can we make shipping better and how can we make the other forms of transportation better. So just as the, the first generation after the age of sail were hybrids, arguably once again we need to look at creating hybrid technologies in this interim period. <clears throat> So an interesting example of this, and this is another model from the museum's collection, is the Shin Atuku Muru, um, which is a Japanese ship. And this was the first commercial sail-assisted um, motor ship. And you can see this was built in the 1980s, <laughs> so she was a little bit ahead of her time. Um, and if we talk about wind-assisted ship, it looks pretty logical. We can see... It's a pretty understandable hybrid design. It's got the sails. Um, but the reason for her being created is perhaps a little bit unexpected when today we're talking about environmental concern. Um, her design was actually driven by the, eight, the 1973 Arab oil embargo. So suddenly, Japan was worried about their reliance on oil and so they were wanting to build ships that would use less of it. Um, and it's a very conventional ship design. So when it's um, anchored, it can hardly be distinguished from similar ships of this period. Um, but when she's at sea, these canvas sails would be released. Um, the ship's designers were aiming for her to have about a 50% decrease um, in fuel costs. And they're expecting that this would therefore kind of pay for the costs of these sales within two years. However, actually it ended up only saving about 10 to 30% of the fuel costs. 
Um, and by the time that she was launched, the crisis was over. Therefore, fuel costs had decreased again, um, which is one of the reasons why the, why the savings were less. Um, fuel usage-wise, she was actually, the sales were more successful than they expected. And one of the reasons was that they actually worked to stabilize the ship. Um, it didn't use any additional crew. Um, this whole ship was still crewed by only six people. Um, and by a flick of a switch, these sails would just come down. So it's a very, very simple system. And to all intents and purposes, it was an extremely successful design. Um, and it did inspire us a small number of similar ships in this period, but it was all governed by economics. So because the price of oil decreased, <laughs> the saving of having these, these sails was kind of negligible. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, though, um, we can see how the designs of sail ships have moved on. So this ship is actually about a similar size to the Cutty's Ark. And whereas the Cutty's Ark has 2,400 2, square meters of sail, the tanker carries only two, 200 square meters of canvas, which is stretched over, kind of taut over a metal frame. Um, so it's a much more efficient than these traditional sails. <coughs> Um, but as I said, looking into it, the, the only reason why this doesn't seem to have been adopted is, is pure economics. Um, when ship design is governed by bottom lines, ship companies are commercial entities, they have to be protecting profit, um, then designs like these aren't supported. <clears throat> In recent years, there's been an increased interest in the use of sails, um, and this is inspired um, by concerns about emissions, um, the perception that um, global kind of restrictions on your emissions are going to, to change, um, and therefore that there's a need for these sail technologies. <coughs> um, so the, the picture that I've got up here is just a prototype. It still hasn't been built. Um, and this um, B9 sail ship um, has been designed um, in partnership with a few other organizations, um, but by um, an Irish company, the, the B9 Energy Group. This aims to be a 100% renewable powered hybrid, hybrid ship. Um, and it would aim to do this by using biogas um, in partnership um, with the sales. Now, one of the, the challenges of putting sales back onto modern ships is making sure that you've got enough cargo space. Obviously, if you start using up your cargo space with sales, the kind of economic viability of your ship massively decreases. <clears throat> Likewise, you have to have the sails evenly distributed to ensure that the ship is really stable, which is why they have the three that you can see here. Now, to get round this, just like um, sail ships um, survived by taking the more niche or less profitable routes, the B9 group is suggesting that this is used for kind of smaller um, vessels. So <clears throat> these are merchant vessels of less than 10,000 deadweight tons. Um, and ships of this size only account for 4% of the total transport network. However, despite only being 4% of all of the merchant navy ships that are in the world, they account for 25% of all emissions um, of the whole fleet. So you can see that if you're going to focus on one type of ship, actually this is a pretty good one to go for. Um, Another reason why these smaller ships are important um, is they are actually a way of connecting the larger ships to shallower ports. Um, and it means that by having these available, you're not instead putting cargo onto, nail, onto rail or road networks. Um, and also they're sometimes supplying um, kind of smaller nations that wouldn't have these larger container shippings. So although they're only a very small amount of the network, they're a really intrinsic part of it. 
So this design has been kind of tested, and it's generally tested very well. Um, it's been studied by a, a number of university groups and academics, and as a design, it, it seems to hold up to scrutiny. Um, however, it's been around for around 10 years now, <laughs> um, and it still hasn't been built. Um, there's some suggestions that this concept might be used for a cruise ship, um, and, and potentially for, for people going on cruise ships, they would be willing to pay a premium in order to go on a kind of more environmentally friendly um, ship. Whereas at the moment, there's no mechanism within kind of container shipping for there to be a premium paid to the, the ship owner for using kind of less polluting methodologies. <coughs> So still looking at this kind of fairly familiar um, concept of having sails, we have the eco-marine power, um, so-called energy sails. Um, now hopefully you can see from the, the image um, that these are slightly different in that they have kind of um, solar power technology interweaven, interwoven into the sail. So the concept of this is that they could be retrofitted onto any type of ship. So whether that's a so-called row-row ferry, so drive on, drive off, um, a container ship or a bunker ship. Um, and um, they can kind of automatically move in order to best capture both wind um, and power energy. Unusually, because they're also capturing solar energy, they're also kind of getting energy for the ship when you're in port. Whereas with sails, obviously, once you're in port, you need to put the sails away. So, still sails, um, but a little bit more of an unusual design. Um, and this does kind of remind me of my little parachute action man that I used to throw down the stairs as a child. <laughs> um, great fun. Um, so you can see it's, it's still going with the concept of using wind as a propulsion. You have a sail, you're using a piece of fabric to capture the wind. Um, but it's more of a parachute-esque design. It's elevated above the ship. Um, and this has three main components. So we, there's the towing coat, co co sorry. <laughs> the towing kite and um, with the rope. There's the launch and recovery system because you want to be able to quickly bring it in and out, which is an automated system um, when there's the kind of right type of wind availability. Um, and the control system for automated operation. So this doesn't need a crew member on board to be looking after it. And once again, this can be added on to a new ship as part of the design, or it can be retrofitted. So it's really important that when people are designing these technologies that they have the option for them to be retrofitted. So just like we saw with our historic sail ships, often ships' usage change um, during their lifetime. Even now, when a ship is launched, it's expected that it's going to last for 25 to 30 years. So during this time, um, changes are often made either in usage or so that it complies with uh, changing regulation. So for ship owners to have the option to take a ship that currently has high emissions and add on new technologies to make it greener um, is very, very appealing. One of the advantages of these sky sails is that they're not really on the ship itself. So all of these components um, can be fitted in the bow, um, so it doesn't take up cargo space. So this is also making sure that you're not taking away from the profitability of the ship. This is currently in operation. Um, on a number of ships, um, and it automatically stows when you're in port, which is obviously quite important, um, or, or when there's bad weather. Um, so, <clears throat> as you can see from this diagram, this sail ship, a uh, sky ship, sorry, sky sail, is much, much higher than your conventional sail that you'd have on your ship um, or your container ship. Um, and this has the advantage that you're getting up to 25 times more energy per square meter than a conventional sail. Um, this 
equals uh, 2,000 kilowatts of propulsion power in good wind conditions. Um, and the manufacturers claim um, that one kilowatt hour of sky sales power costs just six US cents, um, or only about half as much as if you're using the engine. So it's a very, very cheap um, way of uh, propulsion. And as I said, this is being successfully used by a number of ships already. So the examples that we've had so far of, of modern ways to use um, sail power have, have been quite easy to, to look at, and, and we can see that they're still sails. The sky sail, obviously, it's a little bit elevated. Um, but the next example does, looks a lot less like we would imagine a sail. Um, so these are the Fletner, or so-called rotor ships. Um, and these are sometimes called uh, Flettner ships as they are named after the engineer and inventor Anton Flettner, um, who created them in 1919. So as you can see from the picture here, again, this isn't relatively a new technology. Um, the boat that we can see in the picture um, is, the, is a prototype um, called the Baden Baden. Um, and it crossed the Atlantic in 1925. Um, and the way that these um, rotors work, so there's just two here, they look almost funnel-like, um, is by a theory called Magnus propulsion. And basically, all it's doing is it's creating thrust for the ship by having a pressure deferential. Um, so you've got an area of low pressure against an area of high pressure, and this creates thrust, which then pushes the ship along. Although um, the prototype ship was able to successfully cross the Atlantic, they discovered that at this point, the, the rotors themselves were very, very heavy. <laughs> um, so it's suspected that actually the benefit that they were getting from the rotors at this point was counteracted by the increased weight of the ship. <laughs> um, this is potentially one of the reasons um, why this technology really didn't catch on. Um, in the period of the 1920s and 1930s, there was a few more prototype ships that used it. There was a very odd-looking yacht that looked um, very overweighted with a couple of these on it. Um, but, but really, it, it didn't catch on. Um, looking back, some people now suggest that Fletner was kind of ahead of his time. Um, but once again, he was perhaps more driven in the idea to use less fuel because of the security that gives you, um, and also the economic advantages, um, rather than environmental. Um, An interest in this technology wasn't really revived um, until kind of 2008, um, when the E-Ship One was launched. Um, and this has led to a series of new vessels that have been testing out um, these Fletner or rotor sails. Um, and this is very much driven by environmental concerns rather than cost concerns. <clears throat> um, and once again, this is something that can be retrofitted onto a ship that already exists. Um, the example here is the um, Maersk owned Pelican, um, which is a product tanker. Um, and it has had two 30-metre tall rotating sails um, installed on it. Um, and this testing began in 2018, so just last year. And this is the first tanker of this type to try and use them. Um, and it's expected that these rotors will produce a reduction in fuel costs and associated emissions um, from a typical ship of this type by about 7 to 10%. Once again, this is a hybrid. Um, obviously, these rotor fans wouldn't be able to produce enough power for a, a ship of this type. But also, it means that the, the ship is able to keep to its schedule. So if wind power isn't sufficient, it's still able to deliver on time, which is very important um, 
in shipping. Um, so the idea of this test is that it provides insight into fuel savings and operational experience um, and also looking at how this can uh, decrease the environmental impact of shipping. Um, as we saw from the last example, one of the problems was that the original fans, uh, the original rotors were very, very heavy. We have the advantage now of new uh, materials. So these fans are made of a much more lightweight composite material. Um, it's estimated that to retrofit a ship would cost about 1.5 million US dollars um, to install, which is around 5% of the cost of a new ship. So in shipping terms, it's, it's not that expensive. Um, and actually, it's even lower for the cost of a new tanker. So in shipping terms, these are quite affordable technologies, especially when you account for the, the saving in shipping fuel. Um, Maersk is a really interesting example. As last year, um, they announced that they were going to go um, net carbon neutral by 2050. Um, and Maersk is a huge company. Um, they transport nearly one in five seaborne containers. Um, so in order to meet this goal, they're quite open that actually they need these new technologies in the next five to 10 years. As we've already said, ships generally last for around 25 to 30 years. <laughs> so if we're aiming to make these goals by 2050. We're gonna need these ships pretty soon. Um, although we've got the options to kind of retrofit, actually in shipping terms, 2050 really isn't that far away. Um, immerse themselves aren't just pushing one technology. Um, so as we've discussed already, they are looking at the options of hybrid, um, but also biofuels, um, solar powers, hydrogen, electricity. So as a company, they're looking at all the different options that they can possibly do um, and using these few years to try and test out as many as possible. Um, MERS currently emits about 36 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases, um, with container shippings accounting for kind of 98% of the group total. So if a company of this size can, can make even these 10% changes in the next few years, we're actually going to see a huge impact on the amount of greenhouse gases emitted. Um, as is often the case, although we think of kind of Shipping is a, a very distinct form um, of ships. These technologies are being shared across um, different types of ships. Um, now, this is the MS Viking Grace. Um, <clears throat> and the reason um, why I've chosen to speak to her is she's using the exact same type of rotor fan um, as the uh, tanker that we've just seen. Um, so they're produced by the same company, Norse Power. Um, and Vic the Viking Grace, which belongs to a Finnish company, um, the Viking Line, um, are using this again as a test, um, but she's the first commercial ferry to have been fitted with one. Um, now, as we all know, ferries need to run on extremely tight schedules, <laughs> even more so than shipping. Um, and for ferry passengers, they're not going to be very accommodating if they're told, well, it's not a very windy day, so your ferry is going to be a day late. Um, so this is where the use of hybrids are really, really important. Um, and actually, for the MS Viking Grace, um, she's got three alternative fuels. Um, so she has the ability to use the traditional heavy fuel. Um, her engines can also use um, LNG, so liquid gas fuels. Um, and then there's also the rotor fan. Um, but just as with the Cutty's Arc, when you're using fuel as this precious resource, whether it's wind um, or whether it's conventional fuel, the, ship, the design of the ship once again needs to change. Um, so with the Viking Grace's design, they're not just looking at how can she use more uh, green fuels, um, but also looking at, well, how can she just use less energy full stop? Um, so she also has a new form of propeller which is, is much more energy efficient. 
Um, and also it's a much more streamlined shape than the traditional ferries that we're used to. So regardless of which type of fuel that she's using that day, she's going to be using less of it. <coughs> um, and per year, obviously it has to be averaged out, and it's hard to predict how much wind you're going to have in one year. They're expecting that there'll be a 20% fuel savings. Um, and this is expected to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions by up to 900 tonnes per year. So to, to try and kind of make that a little bit more of an understandable number, um, that would allow the average car to be driven non-stop for 39.91 years <laughs> and give out the same amount of emissions. An A747 plane could fly, fly, sorry, fly for 11.84 days non-stop. Um, or the average house um, has the same energy use and emissions for 692 years. <laughs> so one ferry, it is just one ferry, but it can have quite a, a big impact. So as I said, this is just a test, um, but promisingly, the Viking Line have already committed to putting two uh, rotor fans um, onto their next um, ferry that's just being built at the moment and will be launched next year. Um, so when we think of sail power we often think of these very complex um, rigging plans um, from ships like the Cutty's Ark um, and the future of, of sail power in order to lead to a greener and more efficient uh, shipping industry is unlikely to look like this. <laughs> um, we do have, have the advantage that we're able to test much more efficiently new technologies. Lots of the Cutty's Arc's um, designs were based on experience, but also speculation about what they think might work best. Um, and as we discussed earlier, they perhaps actually in her first design put too many sails on her. Whereas we have the advantage now that we are able to prototype and test technologies much better. So, we've seen a few different types of uh, wind power future technologies. We've got the uh, flatner or rotor sails, we've got the sky sails, and we've got things that look very much like traditional sails, and whether they're just using wind power or whether they're also combined with solar. Um, but just as for the founders of Lloyd's would look at our modern day ships and be a little bit perplexed about how exactly they work, and they wouldn't be as they expected. Um, it might be that the, the ships of the future aren't technologies that, that we have yet. Um, however, what we do know is that it's likely that we are going to have these hybrid technologies. So just as we moved away from sail into the use of fossil fuel, we had this hybrid period. It's likely that for the next few years at least, as these technologies are developing, we're once again going to see the combination of traditional fossil fuel usage with more greener technologies. This will take a little bit of, of time. Um, and it also takes commitment um, both from governments, international organisations, organisations like the IMO and the shipping companies themselves to be brave and test out these new technologies and take economic risks. However, we know that these changes are needed. Shipping can't continue to be producing 3% of all the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so, I look forward to seeing all these, these new designs that we'll hopefully we'll see not only being designed over the next few years, but also put into production and tested. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, I believe there's the opportunity to um, view the temporary exhibition downstairs if you would like. Um, but also if anyone has any questions um, now, I'd be happy to answer them. Do you know the packing order of the um, energy efficiencies? Like, is it the wind power first and then the next one would be, I don't know, um, using the solar panel and solar power? Mm -hmm. what, was, what is the packing order? Um, so for shipping, specifically... Because you mentioned five different ways that um, mm -hmm. they can use to use the hybrid. Yeah, um, so 
it's hard to have a specific pecking order, partly because it depends on the exact usage. Um, and also, a lot of them are only in the prototype stages. Um, wind power has a lot of advantages, but it's likely to only ever be used in a hybrid capability with one of the, the other types. Um, LNG is sometimes um, described as one of the like next possible fuels, um, but it is still a fossil fuel. <laughs> Um, and it, one of the reasons why it's sometimes looked as being a kind of greener option for shipping is because um, it has less of the kind of human health effects, um, which are obviously of importance, but LNG during its production produces quite a lot of methane, um, which is kind of relatively more um, environmentally damaging than carbon dioxide. So although sh in some cases shipping are looking at, at moving towards LNG, in environmentally standing, that's actually got quite a lot of concerns um, with it instead. Um, so yeah, I think it's still to be tested, um, but it is likely that all of them are going to have to be hybrids, at least initially. All these wind-assisted ships really have a cost-benefit analysis attached to them that basically says, if I put a, a sky sail up or whatever, I'm going to save 7% of my fuel bills, which will pay back over X years, and therefore I do it. Uh, so what is being done to change the economics of shipping towards the environment? Um, that's a, a very good, good question. Um, sometimes people talk about shipping fuel as being artificially cheap. Um, shipping is using kind of the most polluting form of of any sort of fuel that is still allowed um, in the world it's got extremely high levels of things like sulfur um, so there are some international regulations coming in so in january we'll have the sulfur cap so that will be moving the the level of sulfur you can have in your fuel from 3.5 percent to 0.5 percent in your emissions so this is quite a good interim step um, there will be some benefits from it but actually the in some areas of the shipping industry there's been reluctance even towards this um, and the shipping industry would often argue that they should be allowed to kind of self-regulate <laughs> um, which obviously means that you'll end up with some companies that will will mainly focus on on profit and they are commercial companies they they have to answer to to, to shareholders um, I think kind of if we were to look back at the historical ships, often the, the ship owners that were taking the, the biggest risks and they're the ones that are, are getting the record for, for being the first owner to do something, it came at significant um, personal financial risk um, and often they, they actually kind of don't benefit from, from it financially, which isn't a way forward. Um, I think over the next few years we are going to see increasing um, kind of global um, regulation that will force change in shipping, but it is arguably quite slow. Um, and the, the ocean is this huge immense place. It's, it's very, very hard to, to regulate. Um, so yes, <laughs> sorry, I realise that's not that hasn't really answered it. In the country where the goods are landed. Yeah, um, and you you are beginning to see that a little bit. Um, so with the upcoming sulphur cap, one of the kind of ways to be be able to still use kind of more polluting fuel is to put on board something called a scrubber. So this means that you wash your polluting fuel with seawater. <laughs> Um, which means these pollutants are still going into the water, um, which isn't really in the spirit of the, um, the legislation, but it is technically perfectly allowable. But what is actually happening is countries such as Singapore and the Singapore Port Authority, they're banning um, ships from using these scrubbers within their waters. So it's kind of this balancing act between individual kind of countries and port authorities kind of counterbalancing um, with the, the overarching kind of global legislation. 
Um, it does arguably mean that you, you could end up with, with richer countries and you've already got exclusion zones with the more polluting fuels that are kind of protecting their immediate areas um, and, and poorer countries which don't have that kind of ability to, to strongly regulate uh, are still going to be seeing the bigger impact of the more polluting fuels. But it is definitely something that the countries are looking at.